Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma anfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman ya kareem. And in the previous lectures, we were able to speak about a number of subjects pertinent to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We spoke about... Uh, you know, the historical development of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu We spoke about the authoritative nature of the sunnah. Um, and we spoke about all, three of the stages. And today, bi ta'ala, we're going to be speaking about yet another topic from amongst the topics. And with this, we'll be finishing the sessions uh, of ulum al-hadith. So today is the last session of ulum al-hadith. And then afterwards, we'll get into, you know, actual hadith, bi so today we'll be speaking about how and what was the reason behind why ilmul hadith, the sciences of hadith were really formed. Okay? The reasoning for the sciences of hadith to be formed were, you know, of course numerous. And there were several events that led up to the formation of the science. Just as we said about you know, the compilation of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There were several events that led up to, for example, the compilation of Sahih al-Bukhari. It wasn't compiled just like that. Similarly, ilm al-hadith also had a number of events that took place before it was entirely formed. And the need was there. The need started earlier on. But not necessarily during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. During the pro- lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, we already knew which hadith is correct and which is not. And if we didn't, and if people didn't, if the Sahaba didn't, they could simply go to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him. But that does not mean that certain principles of ulum al hadith weren't taken from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi or the Quran at large, as in the Sharia at large. Certain principles were taken from there, but the need wasn't there as of yet. And when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, now you have Sahaba that had met and lived and you know spent a lot of time with the Prophet Sallallahu So even now, the need wasn't that much, but it started. But it started. Because there was people accepting Islam that weren't Sahaba. And there was uh, Sahaba dispersing, as we mentioned earlier on. They were going into different parts of the world. And so on and so forth. So the need started. And that's why you find that uh, when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala an, he went to Umar ibn Khattab one day, and he knocked the door. And you know how Umar al-Khattab is. Every time something happens, he says, let me take out my sword. <laughs> so, uh, he went to... So he's messing with the wrong person now. Wa alaykum as He went to Umar al-Khattab and he knocked his door. And when he knocked his door, Umar al-Khattab didn't reply. So he knocked the door again. Umar al-Khattab didn't reply again. He knocked the door a third time, Umar al-Khattab didn't reply again. So, then Abu Musa al-Ashari turned, turned around and started walking. And Umar al-Khattab comes walking out of the door and he says, Hey Abu Musa, you know, uh, well, you, did you need me? And why is it that you're leaving now? You should have waited. Something along these lines. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari replies back to Umar al-Khattab and he says that I heard the Prophet sallallahu saying, إِذَا سَلَّمَ أَحَدُكُمْ ثَلَاثًا فَلَمْ يُجَبْ فَلْيَرْجِعُ That if you, one of you knocks the doors three times and he's not answered, then he should turn away and go and walk away. Now this hadith, by the way, most of us might know. Most of us might know. But, you know, not everybody is capable of encompassing all knowledge. 
So Umar al Khattab, he looked at Abu Musa, and what do you think he said? As he used to say at the time of the Prophet, let me, O Prophet, or will I chop off his neck? No, 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 that's not what he said. He said, Now, Abu Musa is really in a dilemma. He said, if you don't bring me someone that can witness to this fact, I'm going to do something really serious to you. <laughs> so you know, the point of the matter is, he eventually went to... Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. He eventually went to uh, the Sahaba, and he was, when he, as he was walking to the Sahaba, he was pale. You know, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is scared now, of what Umar al-Khattab is going to do to him. Because he said a hadith, and he's afraid that nobody else will know the hadith. And it's possible. There are a hadith that, you know, people might have, one person might have known, and other people didn't. You know, Sahaba were dying out, and you know, not everybody has the same type of memory and stuff like that. But this was a hadith, you know, a lot of people seem to know it. So, he went to, you know, a group of Sahaba, and finally he told them, they saw that, you know, he's pale. Well, something's gone wrong here. You know, they said, Abu Musa, what's going on? <laughs> so Abu Musa al-Ash'ari told uh, the Sahaba that, you know, that I went to Umar al-Khattab and right away they knew what happened. Because they knew how Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was. Now, um, uh, and he would only do this in the truth. And only to, you know, sometimes also to teach a lesson to the younger th- Sahaba. They were coming, you know, growing up so that not everybody just starts to just say Prophet ﷺ said, Prophet ﷺ said. And you know, nowadays if we look, this is Umar Khattab talking to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. If we sit in one of our majalis today, one of our gatherings today, every single person has something that the Prophet ﷺ said. Whether he's sure or not. You know, I think, who are you to think? I always tell this to people, who are you to think? You know, you're not ready to think. This is the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. There's something called guidance from the Prophet Sallallahu You take it from that. And not just from your thoughts. Look for example, at um, one of the Khulafa, uh, who had, uh, uh, you know, basically, um, basically, had a dispute with the Mongols. Okay, and you remember the history of how they came and they, what they did to the Muslims and all this kind of stuff. Everybody knows it, right? Or has heard of it. Because it was such a great misery for the Muslims at that time that almost every single person recalls it. And over generations, we hear about it, you know, even in the back of our minds or someone said a mention of it or something like that, even though we haven't read the history. Because it was something so grieving. And that's why Ibn Kathir talking about this. He says that... Over the generations, in the history of Islam, there was not a single set of ruthless murders that was narrated more, you know, ruthless than that which occurred in that time. And probably now in our time, what's happening in Syria. Right? But the point of the matter is that the Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, اُتْرُكُ turka ma تَرَكُوكُمْ That leave off the Mongols, so long as they don't come and say anything to you. What happened was, some of them came to the Muslim lands to, for, to do some business. And when they came to do some business, one of the ruling uh, parties there, one of the rulers in one of the Muslim neighbor, neighboring countries, he killed all of the merchants. So then, uh, Genghis Khan, uh, he was... Um, he was enraged. When he was enraged, what did he do? He was still, um, he was still calm. He didn't go and start to fight. He didn't go start to do any of these things. He sent a messenger saying to Khawariz bin Shah, he told him that, look, you have certain people from amongst your rulers who did such and such to my people. Okay? If you didn't know, then I'm telling you now, and I hope and I wish that you're going to do something about it. So what does this guy do? Khawarizm Shah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him. He goes and kills the ruler as well. Uh, sorry, he kills the messenger as well. 
And when he kills the messenger, this is the time where Khan got enraged. And he basically he picked a fight. And the Prophet, if you listen to the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, what's meant by Turk, by the way, here is not Turkey, Tur- or Turkish people, it's referring to Mongols. He, he said, Utruku Turka matarakukum. Leave off the Mongols so long as they leave you off. They didn't do anything to you, and this guy is picking a fight, and that's why this crazy historical event took place. Where murder was left, right, and center. And history tells us about it. If you look in, you know, to the book of the history. So the point of the matter is that, you know, it comes. It's not that you just say, "Oh, Prophet Sallallahu said," or "I think," and that's why I always tell people it's not for you to think. The Prophet Sallallahu you know, and the um, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala had the of and the manhaj that has been given to us by Allah Azza Wa Jalla is already thought for us. It's already thought for us. Yes, you can understand. And when I say you don't, you, 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 for you not to think, I don't, I'm not calling for you not to ponder the sunnah or f- to ponder the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. Do that as much as you can. But you have to have a certain level of grounding before you can start thinking on your own without any guidance from another angle or without any guidance from the ulama for that matter. That's what I mean when I say, you know, you're not ready to think. Anyway, so Abu Musa, Musa al-Ash'ari, this was one example, where Umar ibn Khattab is now checking and being careful of accepting a hadith. And other examples also occurred during the life of the Sahaba, where a Sahabi would come and give a hadith, and another Sahabi would say, bring me a proof. So this shows you that now they're starting to authenticate. Now, they're starting to authenticate. So the essential message or the essential concept of authentication, it started earlier on during the lives of the Sahaba. And it was narrated by, you know, uh, in, in incidents from Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, similarly Abu Bakr. It was narrated in incidents from Umar ibn Khattab as we just mentioned previously. And so on and so forth. And then, you know, uh, we see on the other hand, that more and more people, Sahaba are being careful. More and more people are entering into Islam. People that have weaker Iman are also starting to uh, get into the, um, the circles of knowledge. These things are all occurring simultaneously. And eventually there's also... Uh, social problems. There's also political problems, and this is one of the largest ones. There's political problems occurring, which are causing people to side with their party, and then say a hadith, or you know, twist words, twist understandings even, of the Qur'an, to suit their reasonings. And amongst the main parties, basically, if you want to call them a political party, would be the Shia. And that's why Ibn Abi al-Hadid, he said that اعلم أن أصل الكذب في أحاديث الفضائل جاء من جهة الشيعة That know that the essence of all lies in terms of the hadith of Rasulullah Wasallam when it came to the virtue of people So they were talking about the virtue of who? Ali رضي الله تعالى, Shia Said that it came from the Shia It came from? The Shia. And this is a fact. And the person that's saying it in Sharh Nahjil Balagha, Ibn Abi Al-Hadid, he's who? He's a Shi'i as well. So it's not like we are accusing the Shia of doing such, rather it is a Shia, Shi'i himself saying and attesting to the fact that the essential bricks of lies in the hadith of, in a hadith pertinent to the virtues of people, were laid down by the Shia. So they started talking about Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, in good terms. They started talking about Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in bad terms. They started talking about Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, bad terms. And similarly, you know, anyone that they 
had uh, a positive connection towards, they would say good things about. Anyone that they had a negative connection to an extent that recently I heard um, that one of, one of the Shi'is, and I heard this with my own ears, he said that Abu Bakr wa Umar kafiran. Wa kafiru man ahabbahum. That Abu Bakr and Umar are two kafirs, and whoever loves them is also a kafir. Now compare that with an authentic statement of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, اقتدوا بالذين من بعدي Abu Bakr wa Umar Follow those two that will come after me. Umar, Abu Bakr and Umar ta'ala. Here is the Shia calling him a kafir radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wa hasha wa kal that uh, that that their kuffar, here is what they're saying, and here's the Prophet ﷺ saying, follow these that, you know, they claim to be, to be the way that they claim them to be. Um, and the fact of the matter is that Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr and Umar, by the consensus of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, are the best two people after the Prophet ﷺ in this Ummah. By the consensus of the Islamic scholars. In terms of their virtues, you know, in terms of their virtues, they're considered the most two virtuous people out of all of the Sahaba. And if you don't, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar are both father-in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ as well. But, um, you know, so this started to happen from the angle of the Shia, and it started to happen from different angles. As I said, political spectrums were some of them. Uh, and also, um, there was a lot of uh, what they called it, the tahzub, you know, what they call sectarianism. That was starting to occur as well. So you had a person, for example, it could have been later on as well, but just as an example, you had someone say, and of course it's a fabricated hadith, undoubtedly. Someone say, يَكُونُ فِي أُمَّةِ رَجُلٌ يُقَالُ لَهُ مُحَمَّدِ بْنُ إِدْرِيسِ that there will be a person in my nation who's called or whose name is Muhammad ibn Idris. Who's Muhammad ibn Idris? Come on, guys. Imam al Shafi'i. Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i. Uh, so there will be a person by the name of Muhammad ibn, ibn Idris. And this is a fabricated narration, fabricated hadith, as in it's not from the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. Fabricated, as in somebody else said it, as a lie upon the Prophet ﷺ. Um, He's more harmful upon my nation than Iblis himself. And is Imam al-Shafi'i that harmful to the Ummah? Rather he's not, the entire opposite. He's the entire opposite. In fact, in other narrations, sahih narrations, you know, um, you have the Prophet ﷺ saying, عَالِمُ قُرَيْشٍ يَمْلَأُ طِبَاقَ الْأَرْضِ عُلْمًا That a alim from amongst Quraysh, one alim that will come from amongst Quraysh, will fill up the entire world with knowledge. And according to Imam Ahmad, and he was at the same time as Imam al-Shafi'i, rather the, the uh, student of Imam al-Shafi'i, he said that this is referring to who? None other than Imam al-Shafi'i. Because if you look at all the ulama that came from Quraysh, particularly from Quraysh, because none of the, you know, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa wasn't Qurashi, uh, uh, Imam Malik wasn't Qurashi al-Asbahi, Imam uh, uh, Ahmed was a Shaybani, so none of them were Qurashis, right? Um, so the point of the matter is that over here he's saying one alim will fill up the entire world with knowledge. If you look at all of the Qurashi ulama, which include the Sahaba, there was not one person that single-handedly filled up the earth with knowledge. As in, his knowledge particularly started to become, you know, uh, common amongst the people. You know, if, if you were to look at the imma that whose knowledge became really common and the layperson would know about him and such and so on and so forth would be who? Imam al-Shafi'i. And that's why, as I said, Imam Ahmad himself, he says that this hadith is referring to none other than Imam al-Shafi'i. Here's the Prophet ﷺ saying something like this about Imam al-Shafi'i. And, uh, and, and, and the, the, these people come and they say such a thing. So this is mawdu'ah. 
This hadith is fabricated. The hadith continues, and he says, وَيَكُونُ مِنْ أُمَّتِي رَجُلٌ يُقَالُ لَهُ أَبُو حنيفة. And there will be another person from my nation, that, whose name will be Abu Hanifa. وَهُوَ سِرَاجُ أُمَّتِي And this is the lantern of my nation. So you can understand which group of people put this hadith. You know, without pointing fingers, and there's vice versa as well. There will be, you know, people from amongst the Shafi'iyya, amongst the Hanabila, saying other things about other imams, because they're so, you know, connected, and this amount of connection is not really required. You know, it's not even praiseworthy. Rather, it's haram. <laughs> because you're saying something above, uh, from amongst the statements, uh, and you're attributing it to the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلَيْتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدَهُمْ لِلْنَارِ Whoever says a lie upon me uh, knowingly, then let him take a seat in hellfire. So it's not a joke, it's a major sin. And according to a very, very weak opinion, but just for the sake of mentioning, it's some of the ulama even said that it's kufr. But a very, very minority position. And a, probably a very weak opinion as well. But the point of the matter is that it's no joke to come out and say the Prophet ﷺ said, just like that. You don't even know. And we see this today. Do you guys agree? Do you guys agree? Or am I talking to a wall? We see this today. You go to a majlis, you go to a gathering, and... You have a person, he gets up and all of a sudden he has something to say about, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said such and such and such and such. You know, and uh, or, you know, he gives a fatwa. And he doesn't know what to do, so he makes up a hadith. To get himself out of that problem. And that's, and even for parents, the ulama actually mentioned amongst the reasons why fabrications were entered into the books of hadith was parents. They would make a claim to their child and they will say something like, oh, this is really sunnah. And then the child would say, Hey daddy, you know, where did you get this from? <laughs> so the dad would now be in a dilemma. He said, whoa, <laughs> you know, I never expected him to ask me that. You know what I'm trying to say? So now the father is in a dilemma. He put him on the spot. And he did the right thing because this father deserves it. You know, so now the father has nothing to do but to make up a hadith. Or the mother alike, you know. So... They actually, the ulama mentioned from amongst the reasons why fabrications took place is where parents didn't have the intellectual humility to say, I don't know. <laughs> and they, rather they made up something, made up a hadith or something along those lines. So you know, at this time, you had things like this occurring. People with weaker iman entering into Islam, you know, hadith getting mixed up with truth and falsehood amongst the you know, general public. Amongst the general public. And then, um, you know, you had at the same time concurrently, you had the Prophet ﷺ, you had his teachings engraved in the Sahaba, companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And what teaching am I referring to particularly? That teaching that gave the Sahaba a, a drive to not only seek knowledge, but also to spread it. And you find that they had a very strong drive when it came to seeking knowledge. A very strong drive. To an extent that you'd have two sahabis, they would make a deal with each other. Let's say we have, a, we have to have livelihood, and we also want to hear the hadith of the Prophet So I'll cut you a deal. I'll go one day, to the majlis of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I'll hear the hadith. In the meantime, you cover my shift when it comes to work, and when we finish, the next day I'll go for work, and in the evening you can tell me everything that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was saying. So they would, you know, pretty much cut each other deals so they could, you know, get every single statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, but not everybody was able to do so, you know, um, as Al Bara ibn Azib says mentioning the point that I was just saying, لَيْسَ كُلُّنَا كَانَ يَسْمَعُ حَدِيثَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. Not every one of us used to be able to always be next to the Prophet to hear his hadith. كَانَتْ لَنَا ضَيْعَةٌ وَأَشْغَالٌ 
We used to have work to do, ضيعة. You know, some people were businessmen, some people had other things to do. وَأَشْغَالْ And just other things to do, you know. Some cook something at home, clean something at home, whatever it may be. وَلَكِنْ كَانَ النَّاسُ لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَكْذِبُونَ فَيُحَدِّثُ الشَّاهِدَ الْغَائِبِ At that point, during the time of the Prophet Sahaba, he says, people didn't use to lie. Rather, another Sahabi says, وَمَا كُنَّا نَعْرِفُ مَا الْكَذِبِ We didn't even know what, what lying was. And we didn't know, we really didn't know what lying was, like you can really lie. In fact, the Arabs before, it was difficult from the, for them to lie because it was a matter of integrity. You know, if your integrity is lost in society, back in those days, especially nowadays, it doesn't matter, you know, sadly enough. Um, if your integrity is lost, then you have a bad name in society. This guy's a liar. You know what I mean? So we didn't used to, he's saying, the Sahabi is saying, we didn't really need, used to know what lying was. And, um, and as I said, concurrently you have the Sahaba um, hearing all of these encouragements from the Prophet ﷺ, طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ You know, it's wajib upon every, or uh, oblig- obligatory upon every believer to seek knowledge. You'd hear all the different virtues of a student of knowledge. So you have all these Sahabas trying their best to seek the knowledge. And one manifestation of that is just what I gave you right now that they would send one person to the majlis where the other one would work, and then they would switch shifts the next day, so that each of them could get all the hadith. And now you have the Prophet ﷺ also encouraging the Sahaba, at the same time, not only to seek this knowledge, rather to pass it on as well. And you have Allah ﷺ saying as well, in the Qur'an, time in and time out, call to the way of your Lord, ud'u ila sabili rabbik, bil hikmah. With wisdom and admonition. You have Allah's Prophet saying, نَظَّرَ اللَّهُ إِمْرَأً سَمِعَ مَقَالَتِي May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate the face of an individual that heard a statement of mine and memorized it. And after he memorized it, he delivered it on the same way he'd memorized it. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, may Allah, he's making dua for this individual. May Allah illuminate the face, make it bright with nur of this individual that hears my statement, memorizes it properly, and then passes it on. So you have a sahabi hearing such a thing. You know, the same sahabi that is switching shifts between him and another. And he says, wow, this is really something that, that I want for myself. So, you know, such happened. The Sahaba started to, and that's what happened. And that's why one of the reasons, besides jihad, one of the reasons why the Sahaba started to disperse was so they could spread this knowledge. So they could spread this knowledge. And since this was the case, that the Sahaba were spreading to seek knowledge, and not only to seek it, rather, to spread it as well, you know, example of seeking knowledge would be Jabir ibn Abdullah who went from Medina all the way to Asham just to hear one hadith. Just to hear one hadith. I mean, some of us have difficulty coming to the class and we come late. Jabir ibn Abdullah traveled an entire country. And it wasn't like nowadays with the planes and everything, it was on a camel. You had Abu Ayyub al Ansari, he traveled an entire country as well, all to hear just one hadith that we can pick up and search on Google today. Min satara mu'minan, satarahullahu yawm al That whoever covers up a evil, a bad deed of a believer, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover his deeds on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cover our deeds on the day of judgment. But you have this Sahabi, by the way. Think about yourself. All week long, you've been traveling just so you can hear one hadith. You're traveling to do this, this you know, exam of yours. All, and you're not traveling for a week, it's an hour long flight to Dubai. Right. Okay? All week long, maybe days on in, you're traveling just to get one hadith. Imagine the type of effect that it's gonna have on you when you actually hear it. From the other sahabi, by the way, Abu Ayyub is a Sahabi who went to meet another Sahabi 
in another country, so he can hear that one hadith from. Though he's heard the hadith, people know it. He's heard the hadith, but he wants to make sure that you know the sahabi is telling the hadith or not. You know, so he goes and hears. Imagine the type of feelings that this individual will go through. It's much different than what we hear when what we will do when we hear whoever covers it. Whoever covers, oh yeah, that guy's got a big nose. <laughs> He doesn't, but you know, alhamdulillah. So, the point is that you have this type of tarbiyah done from the Prophet ﷺ to the Sahaba. This is just one example of, you know, two examples of uh, people traveling for seeking knowledge. Yet people also, as I said, traveling to spread this knowledge. Yet people also traveling to spread this knowledge. And... Since that was occurring, and concurrently, and we keep, I'm trying to paste two pictures here, I'm trying to print two pictures here in your mind. Um, you had people dispersing. You had people that were really keen on seeking knowledge. You had people that were really keen on delivering the message. So since that was occurring, Sahaba are dispersing, now it's becoming harder and harder and harder for the ulama, or for the people to figure out sometimes which is sahih and which is life. This is the point where the need for putting together something in the sciences of hadith, which can decipher right from wrong, came. And this is in short. Because our class is short. The first and one person, or the first or one of the main people, that put together something in this science was Imam al-Shafi'i himself. And that was in his book, Al-Risala, which is in Usul al-Fiqh. Sahih. Somebody's gonna say, no, that's in Usul al-Fiqh, that's not in Usul al-Hadith, that's not Ilm al-Hadith. It is in Usul al-Fiqh, but you'd realize that Usul al-Fiqh does have certain chapters of Ilm al-Hadith. So when the need started to become more and more apparent, you had ulama starting to write down different principles of how to realize which hadith is correct and which isn't. Which hadith is correct and which isn't. The first, one of the first people to do that was Imam al-Shafi'i. In his book al-Risala, though it's in Usul al-Fiqh, but you'd realize that sometimes in Usul al-Fiqh you'd also have some things pertaining to Ilm al-Hadith. Because they're, you know, they go hand in hand. And then you had a person by the name of Ali al-Madini. He put together also a work. Imam Muslim in the beginning of his book as well. He put together something. But the first person to put together a work that was, you know, that encompassed the large majority of everything pertinent to the science was a person by the name of Abu Muhammad, Al-Qadi Abu Muhammad Al-Ramahurmuzi, who died the year 360, Hijri. He put together his popular text called Al-Muhaddith, Al-Fasil Bayn al rawi wal wai A text in which he had collected over you know, these couple of generations the different rules and different works that were put together and compiled them all into one text. So you could find most or the vast majority of the rulings that were in the hearts of people before now imprinted in this text. Written by Ar-Rama Hurmuzi. And then you had people that came one after another, they started to put together, you know, books in the sciences of hadith. Like for example, Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, he put together a book in particular, in pretty much every single science of hadith. He put in every single chapter of hadith, chapter of sciences of hadith, he put together a separate, separate volume. And then you had a person by the name of Ibn al-Salah, and this is one of the most important texts, and I've mentioned it, uh, earlier on as well in our classes. This is one of the most important texts, and one of the most crucial texts in the history of Islam, in the sciences of hadith. And that was Ibn Salah's work by the name of Ulum al-Hadith. And that was his text, what? Ulum al-Hadith by Ibn Salah. And you have, you know, Ibn Hajar, he put together a work as well. So the works were being put left, right, and center. Now to look at, a take a quick look at what exactly were the conditions of a Sahih Hadith. 
A sahih hadith, and with that being said, we'll stop. أَوَّلُهَا الصَّحِيحُ وَهُوَ مَا اتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يَشِذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْرٌ ضَابِطٌ عَنْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي ضَبْطِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ That the first type of hadith is sahih. And this sahih hadith is مَا اتَّصَلْ That hadith which is connected and there is no drop in the chain. So I narrated from Saif who narrated from the brother here who narrated from the brother here. Okay? Now... There, is there any drop in the chain? No drop. But if I take this person out of here, because he was speaking in class, if I take this person out of here, and I just say, say if narrated from him, is there a drop? There is now a missing link. When that occurs, the first condition is lost. Which is that the whole thing has to be connected. And it's not supposed to have shudud. Okay? Shudud is... I'm a very strong narrator. Let's say, you know. Uh, I say that the Prophet ﷺ made Hajj in on top of, or made tawaf on top of a ride, on top of a mount. Another person comes and says, I was there at that incident, that particular incident, when he was making Hajj and he didn't make tawaf on top of a mount. And there's 20 people saying that the Prophet ﷺ made tawaf on top of a mount. One person is saying otherwise. So this is shudud now. These are all strong narrators. One other strong narrator, but he's not as strong because there's 20 of us. You know, he comes and says something else. Now this is what they call shudud. So it has to have none of this. This hadith would be considered da'if and this hadith would be considered sahih. So, because it has this problem of shudud, where it's going against a majority or it's going against stronger narrators. Uh, and there is, you know, no hidden problem in there. Now, to explain a hidden problem is another hidden problem. So, I'm not going to explain what a hidden problem is. Because it's going to take a lot of time and we don't have much time. أَوَّلُهَا الصَّحِيحُ وَهُوَ مَا اتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يَشِذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْرٌ ضَابِطٌ عَنْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي ضَبْطِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ And the last and final condition is that each and every single narrator has to be an upright narrator. Which means that he must be Muslim, he must be of age, past puberty, he must be sane, and he must be Muslim بَالِغْ عَاقِلْ سَالِمٌ مِنَ الْفِسْقِ And he must be saved from apparent sin and disobedience to Allah Azza wa Fisk. He's not a fasiq. You know, someone that smoking, drinking, you can't take his narration. Salimun uh, min uh, fisk, salimun min khawarim al The other thing is, he also, this adil, this upright individual, he has to be, he has to avoid social, you know, um, things that are socially dis- detested. So for example, a person comes in public and starts picking his nose. <laughs> this is something socially detested. So this type of an individual, his hadith wouldn't be accepted. According to the ulama. Think about how careful they were and who they'll accept the hadith from. Even a person, he didn't do something haram, he just did something that's socially detested. So that people don't say that, you know, this is a narrator of hadith. And with that being said, these are the five conditions of Al-Hadith Al-Sahih will stop here and inshallah ta'ala will continue our lessons with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'un.